So the big, like, the big takeaway you have to have from this section is that there isn't like an ideal stream for all five species plus steelhead plus, plus dollies, etc. No two species of Salmonid in the rearing stage have the exact same habitat requirements. You have some overlap, sure, but you can't just make one stream fits all kind of scenario. It just doesn't work like that. Um, here we got a nice picture of a coho, a rainbow, and then you got a stick back in the corner. Those are all out of the same trap. This up in the swan stream. And vegetated natural stream banks provide variations in current, shade, and water temperature, amongst other things. So if you haven't noticed yet, I like a good case study. So I went ahead and found three. Uh, so there's a study on Wisconsin coho salmon. In case you know, so there's uh, four species of Pacific salmon in the Great Lakes now. Uh, I, I think they have everything but chum. Uh, and a study on Great Lakes coho salmon found that juvenile coho sought out areas in the stream where the water uh, speed was less than 10 meters per second. So much so that in some cases, 80% of the salmon were only utilizing 40% of the available habitat in the stream. So, with that being said, you know, Chinook are going to use the faster portions, Coho are going to use the slower portions. So, within a given stream, you have to have a variety of speeds to accommodate all the fish that you want. Another one in the Big Twilight River in uh, British Columbia. And this study found that juvenile Chinook and Coho utilized the exact same habitat after they emerged from the gravel. But as the Chinook got bigger, they required faster current with more oxygen, whereas Coho moved into the slower areas. And so they might occupy the same stream at the beginning, but then you need that habitat variation if you want a multi-species stream. And this one, the steelhead guys may not like that much, um, but this was out of, I think, Oregon or Washington. And it was a study on juvenile salmon residency in a restored stream. So basically they had this stream that had been logged out and it was just like a funnel of water coming down quick. So they dumped a bunch of trees in it. In, that, in the biology world, we call that large woody debris, it's logs and, and whatnot. Um, and they found that after they did that, so after they made the stream more natural and restored, the density of juvenile steelhead went way down, but the density of coho went way up. And so this stream was a, basically a one species show with just a bunch of juvenile steelhead, but once they made it more healthy, they had got a greater diversity of species in it, which is ultimately the goal, right? So here's a, here's a good habitat diversity comparison from the Kenai, uh, down by Beaver Creek. Um, so on the left, this is a well-established root log project, and on the right is not. Uh, so that's a, I don't want to call it a bulkhead wall. Uh, so here, this is a 2D photo, obviously, but if we were to look at this from a boat, those root wads have all kinds of nooks and crannies. We've got overhead cover keeping the water cool. Um, those alders are pumping nitrogen and other nutrients into the stream right there. Uh, you can have all five species represented in a stretch like that. Over here, you've got one water speed. you got no nutrients. Uh, the water's probably warm from that black bulkhead wall. There's less oxygen there. Um, and I mean, I think the biggest takeaway is you have one water speed there. So you might accommodate one species of salmon. But that's it. That's all the value that that has. And so to really like drive that home, because people are like, oh, well, that's that's one landowner. Well, the Kenai River is 82 miles long. I don't know how long the anchor is, sorry. But the Kenai River is 82 miles long, so and it's responsible for producing how many million salmon? I can't, I can't even count. Like the number of juveniles would be a lot. Um, taking even an acre or two out of production is going to have an effect on your bottom line, right? Because you can't make more river. A stream bank water filtration. So vegetated stream banks from appearing areas help prevent pollutants from entering a water body. And then maybe even more importantly, if that water body, or if that pollutant gets in a water body, they help make it not as toxic. Uh, so a uh, really good case study I presented on this spring uh, was with dissolved organic carbon. And basically, did everybody drive a car here today? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So if you did, you, you contributed some heavy metals to the environment, some of which will ultimately probably end up in a river, right? Um, specifically copper and zinc are kind of my two pet ones. Uh, so those come off of tires, they come out of your uh, gas from the exhaust of your car, they come from a lot of different sources. And they have, I won't get into the weeds too much, but they have ill effects on fish. We shouldn't have copper, ex excess copper and zinc in the environment. Um, and what dissolved organic carbon does is it binds that copper and zinc, it doesn't get rid of it, but it makes it to where fish can't take it in. You know, there's a case study out of Austria where Nothing should have been alive in this stream. There was so much zinc in it, everything should have been dead, but they had a thriving rainbow trout population. And the dissolved organic carbon from willows and alders along the banks was taking that zinc and making it non-toxic, at least temporarily. Um, so if we can have, so
So not only do these plants help remove the pollutants that are getting ready to enter a water body, but they make them less toxic if they accidentally get in. So uh, um, really good culvert like this, and I'm not knocking on DOT here, maybe they needed to put riprap. Um, but if you have runoff coming off the left or the right sides of this culvert, even if it has a, a lot of toxins in it, it may enter the water body and be totally benign to fish. If it runs over that riprap right there, it might kill fish like very shortly after it gets into the water. So that's kind of a, a really good case study picture. Um, excessive erosion induced sedimentation of streams smothers eggs and fry, covers spawning gravels, and affects overall water quality. So uh, keep in mind that sedimentation doesn't have to be human caused. You know, it, it can be a natural process. Obviously, we see erosion all around us all the time, right? But if you don't have those riparian buffers in place, all those gravels, all, or not gravels, I should say, uh, sand, silt, usually silt here on the Kenai, right, gets in. And if you have eggs or uh, young ones in the gravel like this, those guys are going to smother and they can't breathe, so you now wreck that generation of salmon. But then, perhaps more importantly, all that silt that gets in between that gravel, when the next generation of adults come back, there's nowhere to spawn in them. It's gone. It's gone potentially forever, right? So that's really the, when you're playing the long game, that's the real issue with sedimentation. And so even if it's occurring, you know, 100 yards above or near high water on somebody's property where they mow their lawn or, or whatever, that's fine. But if there's no repairing vegetation to stop it from entering the river, that's when you start to have problems. So vegetated filter strips on stream banks and repairing areas slow the surface and subsurface flow. That's really important. The flow that you can't see is stopped by that root system. And it traps sediments and any toxins, pesticides, pollutants, some of which we already talked about, but you know, start thinking about like the Kenai River, that's just one big lawn along it. Lots of uh, home use pesticides. Um, and it traps all those that may be traveling with the sediment, and even if it doesn't stop them, it can make them less toxic once it enters the water body. So kind of a one-two punch. Uh, so real quick, there's an awesome case study out of Seattle. Um, they had all these coho salmon are returning and going into bourbon streams, so lots of parking lots, lots of everything. I think one was on the UW campus. Um, and these coho were dying before they even had a chance to spawn, right? And nobody could figure out why. And so they took some from a hatchery and brought them back to the lab. And they took stormwater runoff from uh, an off-ramp and poured it in there and they all died within 24 hours, right? Full of eggs, um, never got a chance to spawn. And then they took that same water and ran it through soil. Uh, like basically they made a fake soil in a barrel and ran it through there and the mortality drop was zero, just with one pass. So 100% 100% lethal to 0% lethal in just one pass. And so that, I love that case study because it really shows how important it is to keep those vegetated stream banks from letting our toxins get into the water. Again, streams themselves are just a conduit for salmon, salmonids, and water. The different habitat components within the stream and on the banks or what drives production and health. Thanks. Wow. Just can we talk a little bit? Oh. You mentioned it um, a little bit in terms of like the Swanson River versus the headwaters of the Anchor River, that there's variation in the size of the mm -hmm. function functioning riparian area. Sure. And um, we know from a lot of the work that the research reserve has done about mm -hmm. like alders that are maybe many feet oh, back, yeah. hundreds of feet back, right. because of um, subsurface water connections yep. are actually very a significant part of the function of that yep. river. Yep, very true. And so, yeah, I guess like um, like I, I I don't if you haven't given this presentation to the Kenai Peninsula. Our assembly, I would encourage you to yeah. do that. Yeah. But I think for them, they would be like, well, you know, it's that question of how big is that buffer, right? Yeah, it's for not sure. a linear feature. Yep. And um, yeah. I yeah, I mean, that, um, <laughs> yeah, the big, yeah, I really like, I use a lot of Cooey's work. Um, or I say the research is really good. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's a big takeaway. Also, with the erosion piece, that the negative effects, more positive effects on these salmon streams can be occurring hundreds of yards away. The repairing area is just defined by the area where the vegetation is directly affected by that stream. But it did, that goes one way, not the other way. 
The nutrients can come from way further away, but what we call the riparian area is just that sort of immediate area. But that doesn't mean that there aren't ill and positive effects coming from way in the uplands, right? Does that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, it's the challenge of it. You know, it's fifth, you know, the direct impact can be 50 feet is defined legally right now by right. the borough, but that in some places it may be smaller, it may be, it may be 300. Yeah, there's feet. definitely cases where 50 foot is not even covering not the whole close area. Close at all, yeah. 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 yeah, and certainly not covering the whole area that affects salmon production. Right. So, so yeah, just that it's a, a functioning zone. It's not a, right. uh, yeah, it's a spatially specific zone. Right, right. Yep, yeah, for sure.